So part of the great work of youth ministry is that you have to find a way to move out of the inertia of the culture and find a place to stay still. And, and one of the ways to do that, and we all know, you know, we, you know we, we should get up in the morning and do prayer. We should spend time in silence. But one of the ways you can do this is every time you're with kids, you do a grounding exercise. You know, so, so one of the beautiful things about youth ministry is youth ministry exists to get you free as well as the kids. <laughs> and so the best youth ministers are the ones who recognize that everything they're doing uh, is a response to their own longing for God, their own longing for freedom. So every time I'm with young people, I mean, I, I just did a project in the public schools. So this was not, I, it was not a religious project, but I would start with playing songs like this, or I would start with silence. And guess what? I got a moment to breathe. I got a moment to sit in silence. I got a moment to recall my own hope for, for God's life in the world. So you could start every meeting with helping everyone in that room, just take a little sip of silence, a little curiosity towards what God's doing, a little space in, in, in that direction to come home to ourself. So um, for 10 years, I worked in a thing called the Youth Ministry and Spirituality Project. We were trying to bring some of these listening skills into churches across the United States and, and contemplative youth ministry that uh, that Jill mentioned is, is the result of, of that work. But we started trying to find ways we could sneak into youth rooms this contemplative stance, this, this stance of being receptive and open and, and ears sort of tilted towards God. And there's all kinds of things you can do, right? You can play the song like I just did. You can turn off the lights and light a candle in the middle of the room. This takes care of about 80% of your noise problems just a candle in a dark room. Uh, you have to figure out who lights the candle, by the way, because that will be the, the greatest tension among especially middle schoolers. Can I light the candle? No, you light the candle. And then you have to make sure they don't pour the wax on their hands like they really want to do to see what happens. But if you get a candle in a dark room and you get kids in a circle and you say, okay, we're gonna close our night or we're gonna open this meeting or this class or whatever, what's some things we can pray for? And maybe it's, uh, maybe uh, nobody says anything. It's too awkward. Maybe there's giggling. And you say, well, I'm, and then you say something real. Can we, can we pray for something I'm worried about? My, uh, my uh, uncle is sick and he's in the hospital and I'm worried about him. And you say something real. And one day, if you do that week after week after week, some kid is going to say something real. They're gonna, you're going to turn off the light. You're going to light that candle. You're going to have that ritual. And some kid's going to say, my mom's really scared about her mom. My grandmother's in the hospital or something like that. And you'll say, okay, thank you. So other things we can pray for. And the kids will go around. And then before you pray, what I would do is I would wait and allow silence before we would speak our prayers or before I would pray for the group. And each time sort of stretching that silence and when I've worked with different middle school kids, you can get it to a minute or two minutes before you have to speak. And you can feel the kids, all of us sort of waiting in there. And I'm working that muscle of receptivity, of, of being open, of allowing the descent sort of of the spirit in the room. I'm working silence into the room, which is such a rare um, practice. So we want to be listening for God and take regular moments to do that. And then we want to take moments with kids where we're pointing them Godward. We want them to send them out on walks, little prayer walks. It's like, okay, I want everybody to go outside the church. You have to walk on your own 10 minutes. And I just want you to say this, God, if you exist, I just want to notice you. And then just take a walk, no phones, you know, no music, no nothing. Just take a walk around the church property or around the neighborhood. And they go out and they have this kind of exotic experience of not having any stimulation, of just being in their senses and walking and seeing what they see and hear and feel. And you come back. And some kids say, that was boring. I hated it. Another kid says, it was weird because I saw these two kids playing skateboard and they weren't very good. And they thought they were very good, but I'm much better than them. And you have somebody else say, you know, I was kind of looking at these birds. I didn't realize there were so many birds around here. And I was just thinking like, God's doing a lot more than just being in this church. 
and conversations will start and you're developing and working that curiosity. Um, my daughter's in high school, she's 18 years old and she's writing all these essays for college applications. And um, it was really interesting that her, her essay that she wrote was about these moments. And I had no idea she was remembered these. But I used to take her up in the mountains above where we lived. And we would sit on the ed edge of this canyon. And uh, I would say, well, let's just sit here. Let's just be quiet and see if we can hear what's going on in the woods. And I would say, now, do you hear God? And we would sit there for, I don't know, three minutes, four minutes. Just when she was a little girl, we would do this from time to time. And she wrote her essay about this. This is what she still remembers, these little moments that were so rare, where you're sort of sitting in, at the edge of the world, listening to hear the, the depth of God's presence. 